Welcome back to our study in the book of Joshua. Uh, today, we are moving forward and we'll be getting into chapter 8. Uh, but first, once again, I remind you of our study, Be Strong and of Good Courage. It's a phrase that Joshua heard from the Lord several times in the first couple chapters, and he also passed it on to his people. Today, we are looking at a chapter entitled Rematch. This is the response to the defeat uh, at Ai, and they Joshua had a problem. Israel had a problem, and it occurred back in the Battle of Jericho. Uh, God had told them, you don't take anything except uh, the gold and the silver. You bring it for the Lord. Uh, nobody takes anything else. And uh, we know that Achan snuck, and he did that, and Israel paid a price because they didn't have the Lord on their side when they went after Ai, and they did it in their own strength, and they lost. So Joshua remedied that in the last chapter, and they're underway. We are in the section of the central campaign at Jericho and Ai, and they're just getting started. You can see uh, the chunk of the book is a lot of action, and uh, it's going to take them a few years to conquer the land. So we are at uh, Ai today, and Bethel, and I'll bring that into the picture in a few minutes of scripture was, that we read, we'll mention it. Uh, what is in green on our map is that central campaign. And may I call your attention to Gilgal, after the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River on dry ground, they established their headquarters at Gilgal. That will remain basically the capital of Israel, not official, for, well, till King David actually takes Jerusalem, has Jerusalem, and makes it his, his the capital. So uh, we see from Gilgal, that was the staging area that they were about six miles away from Jericho, and they went to Jericho and won that, they will move on towards Ai and towards Bethel. And you might notice that with Ai, there is there's a double arrow there, that Bethel joined the ranks of Ai in seeking to defeat Israel to stand against them the second time. So six was the thrill of victory over Jericho. Seven was the agony of defeat at Ai. And here's the rematch. First of all, there's the assurance from God. You need, we need to have assurance from the Lord. We need to know of his presence, not just feel it, but in our heads know it's there, and he's there in our lives. And Joshua and Israel is no different. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Don't be shattered. Don't, don't be destroyed over this loss. Uh, you can get back up and you can win tomorrow. And the word Lord is in the Hebrew Jehovah, and it means the existing one. It's the same word for Jesus in the New Testament in the Greek. And he said, take all the people of war with you and arise and go up to Ai. See, I've given, you, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. God says, I gave it to you long ago, but you violated what I told you to do. And you shall do to Ai and her king as you did unto Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall you take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. And so we're going to get into a narrative, and narratives read very quickly. There are biblical principles as we tell a story that really happened as we see God's presence, God's working, you can see the brilliance of the man of God, Joshua, and lead and leadership and encourage. There's lots of things that can stick out in a, in a narrative and a story. And we're actually looking at real people and how they interact with each other, but how they interact with the Lord and how God deals with them in real life and in real time at, at, a, at years ago. 
And God still deals with his people and God still works with them. So let's move and I'll, I will move through these verses pretty quickly because it's, a, it's an interesting story, but to me it moves very fast. So here's a little close up here. Here's AI. And there's always been a question where it is, but at the end of the story, I'm going to give you, show you some archaeological diggings and finds today. So Joshua rose and all the people of war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them away by night. All right, so 30,000 are leaving by night to position themselves. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, ye shall lay in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not very far from the city, but be ready. So the word ready means firm or stable. Be, a step, be alert. Be established. Have you, know, you have a foothold. Keep it and just remain there. But they went at night. And so this is Joshua's camp, if you look at it. And they went by the way of the wilderness. And that was a regular road through the mountains. There really wasn't another faster way there. And then that put them out in the plains. And I think you can see uh, Ai and Bethel back behind it. And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city, and it shall come to pass when they come out against us, as at the first, that we will flee before them. So that was what they did before, but they only took 5,000 men, thinking that's all they needed. They had a big head the first time. For they will come out after us, till we have drawn them from the city. They will say, they flee before us as at the first. Therefore, we'll flee before them, we'll chase after them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize upon the city, for the Lord your God will deliver it unto your hand. The word seize means seize and occupy. Make sure you take control of the city. Just don't, just don't get in there and beat some of the army. You, you occupy it. So a, some words of clarification um, at, along the way of the wilderness. Do you see under the city of Ai, do you see the word ambush? There's a large hill, a bunker, and it's, it's big enough from behind that anybody from coming up from behind does not know that they're there. And so with Ai, the Joshua will, will establish his camp uh, on the north side of Ai, and it's pretty north where that is. But over on the southwest or over on the west side, you can see the ambush uh, portion of the army will be there. And the little, the first arrow that points at Ai is after Joshua is getting chased and the people, which is that return arrow, then they will head into Ai, which is, has no defense basically, and take it, burn it, and then they'll come with that blue-green arrow towards the red. That's the action. And so what they've done is they've put AI in between, and they will kill the army off, the city who having already been theirs, and it's burning. And it shall be when you have taken the city that you shall set the city on fire according to the commandment of the Lord, shall you do. See, I have commanded you. A lot of this narrative is going to repeat because here's the instructions, and it'll talk about them carrying it out. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and they went to lie in ambush and abode between Bethel and Ai on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged that night among the people upon his camp that said Joshua. Lodged meant to spend the night. And Joshua rose up early in the morning and numbered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel, before the people of Ai. And all the people, even the people of war that were with him, went up and drew nigh and came before the city and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai. Again, pitched is encamped. And we've already discussed this where the big blue area arrow is. And there's Joshua's camp. And he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai. So at this point in the night, he sends the 5,000 back behind on the other side into the valley on the west side. And when they had set the people, even all the host that was on the north of the city and their liars in wait, or those lay, lying in wait on the west of the city, the ambush, Joshua went that night into the midst of the valley. 
And it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, so Joshua wanted to be seen now in the army, that they hastened and rose up early, and the men of the city went out against Israel to battle. He and his people at a time appointed before the plain, but he knew not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled by the way of the wilderness. In our, in our English, that would be capitalized because that was a major highway, way of the wilderness. And this is the main road that Israel came from Joshua and they fled before. And so they started fleeing on the way to the wilderness. Again, that road uh, as the decoy army. And all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them, and they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went not out after Israel. And they left the city open and pursued after Israel. Now all of a sudden Bethel gets added into him and into this, and they're helping out. And the Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand toward Ai, for I'll give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city. And the ambush rose quickly. That was a signal out of their place. And they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand with the spear. And they entered into the city and took it and hastened and set the city on fire. When the men of Ai looked behind them, they saw and behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven and they had no power to flee this way or that. They were boxed in by hills on either side and an army on north and south. And the people that fled to the wilderness turned back upon the pursuers. So Joshua's people, army, as planned, stopped and turned and fought. And when Joshua and all of Israel saw that the ambush had taken the city, and that the smoke of the city ascended, then they turned again and slew the men of Ai. And the other issued out of the city against them, so they were in the midst of Israel, or sandwiched, some on this side and some on that side, and they smote them so that they let none of them remain or escape. And here's the aftermath. And the king of Ai they took alive and brought him to Joshua. It came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying all the inhabitants of Ai in the field, in the wilderness they were in, they chased them when they were all fallen on the edge of the sword until they were consumed, that all the Israelites returned unto Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. They, this was clean up. And so it was that all that fell that day, both men and women, were 12,000, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he utterly had destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Only the cattle and the spoil of that city Israel took for a prey unto themselves, according unto the word of the Lord, which he commanded Joshua. So here they could take things, but before in Jericho they could not. So they listened to what the Lord had to say, and you, they could obey, they could take and do what God said. And Joshua burned Ai and made it a heap, the word heap, a heap of ruins or a mound forever even a desolation to this day, and it was until a few decades ago. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide, and as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remains unto this day. Just a, a word of, of note and of interest. Um, the Lord told Moses and was commanded in the law that if that any kind of executions or, if for instance, a hanging, you did not leave a dead body hanging to the next day, that at sundown was the longest you could and you had to take it down. This was true of Jesus Christ. Jesus had to be off of the, all those three of those men had to be off the cross dead uh, and that's why they hastened him by breaking two of their, their legs and uh, the other guys and causing problems. But they all had to be off and, and gone by sundown. So that, that this is a, just an indication that they were following the law and what God had said. 
there's an altar commanded by Moses, and he said this way back uh, before Moses died and he left. He says, therefore, talking to Joshua, therefore shall be when you be gone over the Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones which I command you this day in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster. And so he's talking about you're going to put the law there and put it in between. It's going to be between two mountains in a, in a passageway for people that they'll always remember. They'll go by this and say, what, what is this? And people would explain to them. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. It means a stone or a bare mountain that looks like a giant stone. Uh, and it is north of Mount Gerizim that is mentioned. And I think you can see north and south here. I have a picture for you in a minute. As Moses, a servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones over which no man has lifted up any iron. And they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. Many of this, the cattle and the, the animals that were in Ai, this would have dropped, they could, they could and probably were used in the sacrifice. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. That's as good that everybody could hear and see. And all Israel, their elders and officers, their judges, stood on the side of the ark, and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the coming of the Lord, as well as the stranger, as he that was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and half of them over against Mount Ebal as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And so, if you look to your right, here's Mount Ebal, and to the left, it looks like a big old rounded stone, doesn't it? And here's Mount Gerizim, and there's the valley in between where the altar would have been built, and you had people of Israel to the right and to the left. The leadership and the altar was in the middle, and Joshua would read the law, and they would listen and hear. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings, according to all that is written in the book of the law. And there was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. All right, there's a couple of groups of people. First of all, there were strangers in their midst. These would have been passerbys or travelers. They would not get on the road when a battle was going on, but they would travel along and just say, may, may we walk with you for safety? We're, we, do not, we don't want to fight you. We know you belong here, or we're headed across your land to another area. These were international highways. And so they could do that. And then there were there, the word conversant here. These were Gentiles that would walk with the Israelites. And I think that they would learn from them, that they may want to, to join them. And there was a way for them to be converted. But they would always be Gentiles, not born Israelites, but they could be grafted in, just like someone could in the times of Christ. All right, finding AI. The, most of the maps that I find has, has AI with a question mark because the maps were made long ago, and they're good maps. Um, but more recent ones are starting to leave a question mark off because AI was just a tough one to find. So how how do you find a city in Israel? Well, you look for hills and bumps, but what you do and what you start and what the the men and the women that found this started is they went to the Bible. And so to find the right place, you've got to go to the right place. And so they went to the Word of God, and here's what they found right in the Bible. They found that the city of Ai needed to be near Beth, Beth Avon, and it needed to be east of or near to Bethel. These are both mentioned in the, in the Bible. To have an ambush site between Bethel and Ai, that meant they needed to, to find Bethel, which they had, and then start thinking, well, this is where we think Ai should be, because here is a Here's a big area, and that those 5,000 could sneak here and hide and then jump out and attack the city. 
they they needed to look and they found in the word of god that they that there was militarily significant hill north of Ai where the israel army could camp they could camp behind a hill and they would have 25,000 people there and they needed it needed to be close to a shallow valley north where joshua and the decoy force could be seen by the king of ai so all those things had to exist and so here's Beth Aven and here's Bethel with the arrows pointing. And then in red is where the site of Ai is. And of course, with other nations moving into Israel, places get renamed. Um, and, it, and Israel today has to live with them. Today, uh, one can see how the battle unfolded by looking at the topography around Kirbet el Makatir which was that print, and I'm going to go to that. You can go back and read the rest of that. But can you see over to the far left, there's Kirbet el Makatir. That's Ai. And there's a mound there. There's also roads that go right by it to the, to the right and comes swings down. And, uh, of course, the roads would be the way of the wilderness, one of them. But over to the far right is a wadi, and that's a dried up crick bed. If I'm from Ohio, and that's what you call the cricks, the little streams and small rivers. Um, that's where the ambush force would hide. And so once, uh, once uh, people of Ai left their city, then you got them. Okay, what happened is that we're looking, um, we should be looking east, uh, straight across, and north is left and south is right. How to know when you find it? So how do you find, how do you know that you're there if you found the city? If you get the right place from the right place, then you're going to find some right stuff from the from the right place. So there there were fortification walls. Joshua calls them. The Bible calls them fortified places. That means they're walls. They make them really thick, and oftentimes they can dig them deeper and build them higher. There needs to be a main gate facing north because that's implied in Joshua 8:11. It's a relatively small site. And if it's a city where people live, there has to be the presence of women. And you say, well, that's a given, isn't it? No, it's not. Because towns, oftentimes a town would be built as, a, as an outpost. And you would put your army out there. And it, was ju it would just serve as, as the first defense of an invading army or forces. And then those were coming and they could send riders uh, and and get help. And so they would build these fortresses around, and people might say, well, AI was just one of them. Okay, so that's why they'd make the statement, there needs to be a presence of women. And so the excavations of Kirbeth el Makatir have revealed us a, a small border fortress dating back to the middle and what archaeologists call the Bronze Ages. It's about two and a half acres and that's about the size of Ai. And there were fortification walls on the north and west side. They were 15 feet, 13 feet wide. And uh, there was a four-chambered gate that has been unearthed. And two of the gate socket stones were discovered right by the gate passageway. Others were found nearby. So let's look at some pictures. Here's one of the socket stones that they would cut and it would go down into the ground and then the iron rods would secure the gate into that. It would swing. Of course, it would creak a lot. But they would build these thick, heavy, and put them in deep and solid so that that wasn't, that, that wasn't a weakness in your city wall. And they, this is a little bit more of their diggings that they've come up with. They found nearby two more socket stones. Here they are for display. And 
And here's a fun picture of them digging. Yay. Can you see civilization out in, in the back? These archaeological sites uh, in the upper left, there's homes. I see electricity, I see telephone poles. And oftentimes roads, as you saw, roads go right by these archaeological sites, these old cities. And there was an infant burial jar with the remains inside. There's a baby, then there were women present. Very interesting. So it has to be the right dates and evidence of the occupation. It had to be like in the 15th century before Christ. There also had to be evidence when they dug of destruction of fire, and, and they've unturned that also. There have been black rocks. Three Egyptian scarabs were found in that date window, meaning Egypt has come up through there, or they've traveled to Egypt and come back. It's a travel route. It's a stopover. And here's what a computer has, has pretty well built the city to be and to be look like to look like. It was not massive, it was not big. Keep in mind, people would live in the city, and business would be done in the city at the city gates. But the farming and the animals and all that, that would be on the outskirts. And they lived on a plain, they had hill country. But if they knew they were in military danger, all the people would come in come into the city and all the men basically would become part of the army. In the case of AI, the only ancient text with information about the site is the Bible. In Kirbet, al Makatir is the only site that meets all the biblical criteria and has the right stuff in the right place at the right time. And so we probably can say right on. So I close with how to win. So it always needs to be a takeaway. And this is all about what caused them to lose AI to start with. And it's a good reflection on our life because these are, these are quotes out of the Bible. Um, you know, when we, we, get, we get away from the blessing of the Lord and we lose sight of God and we wonder where God is, we need to look at ourselves and and. Israel and Joshua saw their sin. They looked at it and said, Lord, we have sinned against you. We have not done right. And we don't know who did this, but point them out and they did and we'll take care of it. And so they, they saw who they were and they, they saw where they failed, where they'd sinned against the Lord. And when, when Achan was found and his family Achan confessed that, but Joshua and the priests and the Israel needed to confess that sin before the Lord. And Israel, when they attacked Ai the first time, they Israel determined the size of the army, saying, this is a small city. We can knock these guys off with 5,000 people. And they didn't. They lost. And when we confess our sin, we have an opportunity to give our life anew to the Lord. Start all over, because we find forgiveness there. And this is not about being saved, and there must be there there is forgiveness received of the Lord for all of our sin when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. But then it, we in our life as we go are not perfect, and we see flaws in Joshua and we see flaws in Israel along the way, and we need to understand that we can find forgiveness. So we, we see our sin, we confess our sin, we give our life anew to the Lord, get up and get going again for God, just like Joshua and the children of Israel did. I want to thank you for being with us today. If I can be of any help to you, this is my email address. I'll be glad to send you a hard copy of the lesson. Father, thank you for the example of Joshua and Israel again in this chapter and just the power of God that was given to them and that they could see and that they could live. Thank you for their example. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you all.